You that bleach. Yellow fever, Fela Kuti. Uh, spliced in between yellow fever, Fela Kuti. I played an NPR report. And I, I think I might have played it before, but, you know, I don't think we could play that enough about the disparities in disaster relief. Uh, I, I actually navigated away. Let me pull that back up. All right. Amid climate change, FEMA and government widen uh, favors the rich. And uh, in the report, even though they tried to make it a rich, poor issue, they could not avoid the fact that it was actually a black, white issue. And the most uh, telling aspect of that report um, by NPR was the fact that the white man who received all of the FEMA and government benefits said that he didn't like getting all those benefits. He didn't reject them. He didn't say, no, I'm not going to take them, but he was like, you know, I wasn't comfortable taking all this money from the government. I wasn't comfortable having FEMA buy my house, a house that was worth essentially nothing, give me above market value for my home. I wasn't comfortable being a white man, a, more likely he lives in uh, Texas, so you know he's a conservative Republican white man taking government handouts. A conservative Republican white man who went to his job at Microsoft, and Microsoft said, hey, we'll pay you. Don't come to work, don't worry about it, get yourself together. And the black woman who is a mail carrier, a federal employee, and we always talk about how the federal employees and how the federal government is incompetent and how the bureaucrats don't know nothing. She didn't get the time off, she didn't get the government support, and when she appropriated the FEMA funds in order to reestablish her family, she was scolded and driven to not even pursue FEMA funds anymore. And the reason I'm playing this, I'm, I don't, I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it a buck with you. I don't remember if I played this anymore. I, when, I, when I first heard it, and then I went and read the transcript, I'm like, I'm going to have to play this on the air. But um, the reason I'm playing this is because right now, the Midwest, I'm going to have to play this a few more times now that we're in the midst of uh, global warming uh, climate change, global warming carbon emission driven climate change. I might have to play this because right now, Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, Missouri are all underwater. And as I'm so fond of reminding everybody, and I don't know why I have feel compelled to remind everybody, I'm from Missouri or Missouri, depending on, you know, what part you're from. I'm from Missouri. And, uh, I know this is going to happen. It, basically by the time NPR, which is, uh, what they call National Petroleum Radio. NPR is government propaganda. It's liberal government propaganda. And by the time they're saying, look, you know, this is really bad, whereas government handouts are pretty much established and, and, and directed to benefit white people and to reduce the benefits to blacks, if not directly and immediately harm black people. And we've seen, especially exacerbated, which really this was going on under your beloved Obama. But it's really been because Trump is so uncouth. Trump has no tact. He has no grace. A lot of the ongoing injustices of the federal government are now naked before the world. When as before, we had diplomats, we had a lot of very well-trained PR professionals who go into government to make the empire seem more humane, who make, uh, who give the illusion to the masses that there is, this is still a civil society governed by laws. Trump has blown all that up for two reasons. Trump got rid of a lot of the dedicated bureaucrats because he wanted to build what is called a kleptocracy. So he got rid of a lot of the competent and, more, and, 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 and moral bureaucrats. But then also, Trump has a very hard time bringing anybody of substance and quality into the White House to work for him because he has rolled over, subverted, and humiliated just about every single appointee and subordinate that's ever been under him, starting with his wife, his children, his extended family, he watched his brother drink himself into oblivion and mocked him and robbed him the whole time of his inheritance. So some people, even some corrupt right-wing racist, proto, 
and neo-fascists and Nazis, they're even saying, you know, I like Trump, but I, I, I'm not going to work under Trump. I'm not going to go, go on Trump's payroll because I'm not trying to be like Cohen. You know, I'm not trying to go out like, like uh, Cohen. I'm not trying to go out like Manafort. So Trump is having a lot of trouble continuing the facade that America is a democracy, that America is a republic governed by laws and that no one is above the law, that America is, the United States of America is concerned with sustaining civil society, justice, the American way, and all that nonsense. As I said on election day, the velvet glove is being removed from the iron fist of US imperialism. And not only has the now not only that it's been smashed upon our heads. And so for you know the past three out of four shows we've been talking about reparations. And something that I think has been absent from the reparations discussion is that reparations by definition by practice, by law, by edict, mandates a secession, a, a ceasing of the atrocities. You have to stop the atrocities before you can repair the atrocities. Malcolm X said you can't stick a knife in my back four inches, pull it out two inches and call that justice, call that reparations. You can't. But we see right now, black people are being denied our due. Black people right now are not getting what is owed to us, even though we have full constitutional rights. We have demonstrated that we are the most loyal, most patriotic demographic in America. Yes, black people are more patriotic than any of, we are the true believers. There has been no group ethnic, racial, historical, cultural group that has demonstrated a more consistent loyalty in the face of utter attack, dehumanization, than black people. You even have populations and ethnic groups of Europeans who have sided with Americans' enemies, who have acted against U.S. interests, who have invested their, re their time, their resources, their loyalties in the enemies of the state. Even Trump has, even amongst Republicans, they say he seems to have confl confl conflicted loyalties. And even under all of that, they still are holding to Chancellor Williams' edict. And I think every black person should know this edict. I repeat this often. I think this every day in my head. And I know one thing, one another tragic thing about being oppressed. Not only are you dehumanized, are you attacked, is your life expand, uh, expectancy reduced, are the resources that come to you and your offspring corrupted, contaminated, and often absent. That's one side of oppression. The other side of oppression is for you to acknowledge the oppression for you to detail, to you to seek to study, for you to seek to understand your oppression will make you even more vulnerable, will bring you under even more aggressive attack, not just by the oppressor, but by other oppressed people. People come to you and say, pull the race card, victim mentality. And let me tell you something right now. If you're a black person that has ever said or talked about the victim mentality, just check yourself out. I'll tell you like Dick Gregory said. I was going to say something else, but I'm going I'm to I'm bow to Dick Gregory. Get in the corner and check yourself out. That's what he would tell people. Get in the corner and check yourself out if you're one of those black people that talk that victim mentality rhetoric. But I want to share with you what I'm going to call a... Uh, the Chancellor Williams edict. Chancellor Williams said 
white people are black people's implacable foe, that they are our eternal bitter enemy. And I know this, and, and then he, he said a qualifier. I don't think he needed to say anything beyond that. If you read Destruction of Black Civilization, I don't think that statement needed to be qualified. But he went on to say, this is not the rantings of a wide-eyed militant. Maybe coming from me, it sounds more like the rantings of a wide-eyed militant. But when Chancellor Williams sat down, now you have to, Chancellor Williams was one of the talented 10. He was an educated black man. He owned property. He was a tenured professor. He had uh, savings. Uh, and, and, and he had enough money to live a good life going to, to, to live in, in the ivory tower of American academia, go to all the best tea parties to be celebrated. He could publish in any historical journal or go to any major publishing house in America and write books about the glorious history of America, the triumphant history of African Americans. This was a dude who was set. He was up there with, with uh, Skip Gates. Like that's what Skip Gates, the life Skip Gates is living right now with his New England mansion, summer house in the Hamptons, whatever. That's the life that Chancellor Williams could have had. But in Chancellor Williams decided to leave his job, to take his life savings and even mortgage his house. Because he said, even though I'm good individually, my people are in a really bad place. And I think he concluded like um, Dr. Claude Anderson. There's only three explanations for the state of black people in the world today. One, we are inherently, genetically, inferior to other races. Number two, we are cursed by some divine force. God has cursed us to be in this place because of some slight or some violation we've committed against the divine power. Or three, there has been a conscious, deliberate, consistent campaign to subvert black people. Those are the only three explanations. And so Chancellor Williams said, I want to understand why black people are impoverished and oppressed. I want to understand why Africa is colonized. I want to understand why anti-blackness is the world's only universal ideology. Anti-blackness is the world's only universal ideology, meaning that you can find people who hate each other. You can find two cultures that have nothing in common. The Japanese utterly hate the Koreans. And the Koreans justifiably, if you know their history, justifiably hate the Japanese and hate the Chinese. Even though, but I'm not going to get too deep in that. But what I'm saying, you go to China, you go to Japan, you go to Korea, which are cultures that are, you know, couldn't get further from Europe. Western cultures and you go to these places and they see dark skin as less attractive. They think that black people, they have the same conclusions about black people. They're lazy, they're unintelligent, they don't have values and morals. You go to the other side or you go to the Polynesian world. You go to many black countries. You go to Kenya and Kenyans think, aside from Kenyans, all other black people are trash. They don't want other black people in their country. You go to South Africa, and South Africans think any non-South, all black people, black Americans, West Indians, Zimbabweans, they don't like them. So even amongst this, when this anti-blackism, universal ideology does not exclude black people. The grand, the beloved, the most honorable uh, leader of the economic freedom fighters. He stated that in South Africa, he said, when you see a white man or an Asian man 
walking in Africa, they're called investors. When you see a non-South African black person, they are called foreigners. This is self-hate. So, in a world where you have an educated man with a brilliant mind, it's really hard for truly intelligent people to be immoral. That's why they tell us you need religion to be moral. No, you need intelligence to be moral. It's really hard for an intelligent person because an intelligent mind is a synthetical mind. An intelligent mind understand the inner relationship of all things. An intelligent mind begins to unravel the so-called mysteries of existence. An intelligent mind is a just mind. It takes a brute. It takes a savage. It takes an ignorant, psychopathic person to be so fundamentally immoral, like Trump. Trump's stupidity is one of his greatest assets. He wouldn't be where he was if he wasn't such an idiot. And I know we we this is a contradiction because we think no, it's all these smart people that are the that are billionaires. But then you go and look and you find that most of the smart people, they really didn't get to where they are from brilliance. They got from where they are from being corrupt. And they generally would rob or rob the backs of truly intelligent people because the intelligent people are too busy creating, too busy, you know, engaging, too busy cultivating themselves, whereas, and they tend not to focus on the money. But I digress. Chancellor Williams who was a moral man, a righteous man, a just man, decided, I'm going to mortgage my house. I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to take my life savings. I'm going to beg, borrow, hustle, scrape, and steal so that I can travel the world. Now, this man is a scholar, and he understands about the academic arena and how it operates on grants and fellowships. But he couldn't get money to write this history. No white people. They would pay him to go study migrant farmers. They would go study, oh, you want to write another biography on Dr. King? You want to write another uh, triumphant uh, uh, story about the, the civil rights movement, the Reconstruction era? You want to go study all that and how the black people's path from the plantation to being full American citizens? Black people can get all the money, all the fellowships, all the grants, all, into, all the historical. You can get there. But he's like, no, I don't want to write that. I want to write the history of how black people came to be subordinate to white people, how white people came to be dominant over black people. I want to write the specific detailed history, and I want to go all the way back to 2000 BC. I want to go all the way back from the very first encounters black people had with white people, from the very evolution of the very concept or consciousness of a, there being a such thing as a black person or a white person. He wasn't going to get a dime for that. So again, he mortgaged his house. He begged, borrowed, still took his life savings and eventually lost his life sight, his eyesight and his health to do this. And he traveled the full spans of the African continent. He got the oral history, the written history, the ignored history, the distorted history. And he compiled it into a couple of books. And through looking at all of this history, the interactions between Africans and Europeans, Africans and Arabs, Africans and Asians, Africans and other Africans, Africans and Native Americans, he concluded that throughout history, there was never a time where he could find black people and white people within the same geographical space where whites were not relentlessly predatory towards the blacks. And black people would either try to seek escape or relief, but never conquest. So he concluded, not because he's militant, not because he's deranged. He concluded from the sober analysis from the facts that spread out before him, that he had spent a second lifetime compiling this data. That white people, he didn't say racist, he
He didn't say capitalist. He didn't say colonizers. He said white people. Are the eternal foe of black people? The implacable foe, our eternal bitter enemy. And there was this search thing, as we call, the law of misknowing. Chancellor Williams has the edict, the, Wilson, the, 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 the Chancellor Williams edict. Every black person, whether you agree with this or not, should at least know this. And if you disagree with it, you should have the history. You should be able to say, well, no, at this time in history, this black tribe, this black nation, this black community, this black demographic lived in proximity or in relationship to this non-black demographic and there was not predatory behavior, collective predatory behavior exercised by the non-black demographic against the black demographic. So if you don't disagree because it's uncomfortable, don't disagree because you have white people you're fond of. I have white people I'm fond of. You come look at my bookshelf, Half the damn books are written by white people. I guess that's how I express my fondness for people. I guess I'm a little bit emotionally stunted. I buy your book. If I like you, I buy your book. <laughs> if you don't have a book, there's no way to figure out whether I like you or not. <laughs> you know. But I'm not anti-white. Some of my best books are written by white people. That's what I say. But so you might have white folks you're fond of. I have white folks I'm fond of. I play them on the show. I quote them. So you want to personalize this global phenomenon, this historical phenomenon. You want to personalize it. That's not how you engage in academia. That's not how you do research. You know, when you personalize things, you taint the data. So put aside whether you have a white spouse, a white homie, a white Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or a white God that's going to take you on high. Whatever white entities or white individuals are in your life, set that aside and just look at the hard data. Same thing I encourage white people to do. I never owned a slave. I'm poor. Yes. Okay. But again, take that black person you love individually or the white co black co-worker you get along with. Put all that aside and let's all take a step back. Let's all rise above and look at the totality and show me the data. Not your, don't tell me your feelings. Don't tell me your thoughts. Because we're looking at an ecological. We're looking at the milieu. We're looking at the fundamental culture. You could go live in Fukushima, Japan which is a land contaminated that will be contaminated in perpetuity by radioactive fallout. Now, you can feel how you want to feel about Fukushima. I love Fukushima. I love the land, and I don't feel that it's radioactive. Who cares how you feel whether or not it's radioactive? You might even go to a radioactive places and say, I feel fine. But ultimately, the facts, the data will overrule your personal feelings every single time. And yes, maybe there have been some black folks who have been able to create pockets, pockets of camaraderie and justice and friendship with white people. I don't deny that. Go ahead. Knock yourselves out. But again, your personal experience does not extrapolate, is, 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 the, is the exception. That proves the rule. So understanding this, understanding the law of misknowing. Now, I like, I think misknowing was brought to us by Neely Fuller. But I have so much that I disagree with on this Neely Fuller. I disagree. And there's some people I've had, I've sat on the stage and had to, uh, it wasn't even a debate, it was a forum. I sat on the stage at Mega Evers College, and it was a forum that we were talking about the assault on Africa and black people. Or is Africa under attack or Africans under attack? I think some kind of clever name at Megar Evers College. And for some reason, they invited me. I know the reasons, let me not say something. But I wanna sit down and be humble. But then for some other unknown reason, they brought out 
this guy who was literally a Nilly Fuller disciple. Nilly Fuller and the code system concept. He has, you have some people who, who are academically follow him, who, who, who read his writings, who, who go to his lectures, and who engage in, in analysis of his analysis, who agree and disagree, but there is a small sect of, of, of Millie Fuller people who are absolute disciples, who question none of his words and follow his program for, for, cause he said he has a code system and concept for the elimination of white supremacy. And some people are like, if this guy has written the, he's literally, I wrote the book on how to navigate who live under white supremacy and conduct your life to speak, to walk, to dress, to interact with other people in such a way to eliminate white supremacy. So I've sat and talked to some people that followed his cult. And it wasn't pretty. Now, a nearly fuller reader, a nearly fuller researcher, a nearly fuller adherent is different than a cult. But I just say, I don't, I prefer uh, what Dr. Wade B. Nobles. Because he took the, the law of misknowing and, and expanded on it a bit. And I think he has a, a better, even though I, I give Nilly Fuller full props, I, I respect the fact that Nilly Fuller and Dr. Francis Quelson, Cress Welsing Cress brought the, 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 uh, the identifier of white supremacy. Now, black people always lived under white supremacy, but it wasn't safe to identify. Like I, I've said before, our oppressor is the type of oppressor that will stomp on your face with a boot and then sue you for getting mud, uh, blood on his boot. So he, he'll stomp on your face with a boot and then demand that you pay him reparations for bloodying up and dirtying his boots. He'll want to send you the fee for, for his boot cleaning fee. I mean, supreme evil. An absolute absence of humanity. So I understand why black people, even though we lived under white supremacy, we couldn't say it. We couldn't say it. There was a video that surfaced that was, be, that was in the, filmed either in the early 60s or late 80s. I mean, early 60s or late 50s. And it was the camera crew that went to the South and they had three white men, working class white men not skilled laborers, just proletariat white men who were just having a, 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 conference, a conversation and, and the journalists asked them, you know, what about race relations? And they were like, race relations are good, damn good, boy. Everything's good down here. And they found a random black man who was an older black man, a black elder. And they say, hey, boy, come here. Tell them how good it is down here. And the black man dropped his head and was like, yeah, everything's great. Because they will give you hell and charge you rent. So we, for a long time in this country, living under the most brutal oppression, couldn't call it. We couldn't name it. We couldn't study it. We couldn't identify it. Because you get greater reprisals. I'm a victim of racism. And the moment I acknowledge that, the, the, that I'm a victim of racism, I also become a victim of even more racism. And not only do I become a victim of more racism, I then stand the, the, the strong potential of being attacked by my own people. You making excuses. I'm sick of blaming the white man. You got to work twice as hard to get half as far. I heard that as a kid growing up. My elders would say that to me. Bless their hearts. I know they wanted what's best for me. They wanted me to get a good education. They wanted me to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And they wanted me to eat healthy and strong, eating as much pork as I could get my hands on. But it's what they knew. It wasn't malicious. They thought that's what, that's what they were indoctrinated into. And one thing they also said is don't provoke white people. Don't wear your hair in such a way. Don't wear clothing colors. Don't speak in a manner. Do not offend white people, even if they're attacking you. We're telling black kids this now. Even if the police are violating your legal, your civil, as the police violate your legal, civil, and human rights, black folks, black boy, do not provoke them further. 
If you're going to be detained and harassed, it's better than being handcuffed. If you're going to be detained, harassed, and handcuffed, it's better than being brutalized, punched, and kicked, and have your teeth kicked in. If you're going to be uh, detained, harassed, handcuffed, and brutally punched and kicked, it's better than being shot and crippled. If you're going to be detained, harassed, handcuffed, brutalized, shot, and crippled, it's better than being dead. So even at each stage of this dehumanizing process, black people have been taught, nay, indoctrinated to not further enrage, provoke, or upset our oppressors or our oppressors' representatives, black cops. So I think now living in 2019, black people, you know, they walk around, these young people walk around talking about, I'm not my ancestors, you can get these hands. Where well, I ain't seen the hands. I'm still waiting on the hands, millennials, exennials, young people, 80s babies, 90s babies, 2000 babies. Where are these hands? Where? Because all your ancestors, they burned down three cities. It's 1919. Go back and study. And 100 years ago, 2019, black people went head up with these crackers. Where are you at? Where are the hands? Now, last time I seen there's, you know, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, Baltimore. But them wasn't, them wasn't exennials. Many of y'all were still in grade school during Baltimore. L.A. riots, many of y'all weren't even around for the Rodney King riots. Rebellion, uprising. I'm sorry, I'll never use riots again for the, for, in that context. You heard it here. That's my commitment. The Rodney King rebellion. The L.A. uprising. Where are the hands, young people? Show me the hands. You know, back in the 50s, no, hey, we can go back further than the 50s. We can go back to World War I. Sharecroppers were taking up arms to fly off to, to, to uh, Abyssinia, to Ethiopia, to fight the Italians who were trying to colonize the last non-colonized piece of African territory. So show me the hands. But I digress. Dr. Neely Fuller, Dr. Francis Crest Wilson, back in the 70s, came out and said, we live under global white supremacy. This is during the Cold War. And black people, if you would stand up and call out racist, they would call you a communist. <laughs> they would say, you, you don't love freedom. America's freedom, communism is oppression. And if you say anything against America, even if it's factual, if you say anything to negative America, then you're giving ammunition to a, the enemies of democracy, the enemies of freedom, the dirty, evil, com godless communists. They came out and said, and under that atmosphere, global white supremacy. The world is under global white supremacy. At the very time, the white supremacists were running around the world saying, capitalism is synonymous with democracy. Democracy is synonymous with freedom. Freedom is synonymous with Western values and Western civilization. And it was a revolutionary act. And now it just rolls off the tongue. You're around black people who claim to be uh, e even conservative blacks. They're all oh, white supremacy. Yes, we're all global white supremacy. You go on CNN, you go on Fox News, and you hear them all ham bone, Uncle Tom, handkerchief, head, sellouts, talking about, yeah, well, the uh, white supremacy. It's just a thing now. I don't like that phraseology. I prefer global white domination. I think it's more accurate. Because I know inferior beings can sometimes dominate superior beings. That is a, when a, a, a virus, a pernicious bacteria, a parasite, we don't see as superior beings. But you take a majestic lion, the mighty rhino, and they can be failed by a lowly virus, a lowly parasite. But would you say a parasite is supreme to a rhino? Would you say cancer cells, malignant cancer cells, are, are superior to healthy cells? So I don't like, but a parasite, a bacteria, a virus can come to dominate a healthy organism. So it's a situation of domination, not supremacy. They didn't outwork us. They didn't outthink us. They didn't outproduce us. They can't even outrun, jump, or, or, or they can outswim us. I mean, <laughs> I hate to be so crass, but damn it, I mean, it's late in the day. 
The Midwest is underwater, and you know the Midwest is the breadbasket, and the land is saturated, and today's the first day of spring, which means the Nebraska corn huskers, they're not going to be able to grow all the corn and the wheat that they were uh, and soy that they were expecting to. And the corn, wheat, and soy is what they feed to the cows. So beef prices, everything's going up. People are already stressed and, and harmed. And then there's a trade war that he provoked with China. So import, export, it's about to be a mess. This this Midwestern flooding, which I, I, might, I don't even know if I have time to get into that. It's a, it's a big deal. So all things are interrelated. It's just, it's, but I continue to digress. Well, let me just say, I prefer domination. I think global white domination is more accurate. But we have trouble with evolving. Something gets in and it sticks. I wish black people would stop saying global white supremacy. Even white people, racist, your enemy even, by the time white people embrace it, oh yes, I'm a white supremacist, oh yeah, oh, thank you for the compliment. I'm a white nationalist. They're not going to say, well, I'm a parasite, which is what they truly are. Bezos, Jeff Bezos, parasite. Billionaires are parasites. They're not supreme, they're parasites. So unless you're the type of person that thinks a blood-sucking leech is a superior creature. <laughs> but I digress. All the way back. We finally are able to say, call it out. But there's a lot of black people that can't. There's a lot of black people that go into work that go into classrooms, that go into to life, and they're uh, like uh, Russell Simmons' daughters. And they subjected to, to overt racism, and they can't even call it. So understanding this, we're not, and, and it's another thing I want to point out. It's another thing I want to point out that I thought about with this Trump thing and this Mueller investigation, and all this talk of impeachment, and they talk about the 25th Amendment. And the 25th Amendment is, is a basically a law that states that if the president becomes mentally incapacitated, whether the president has a stroke, or the president just has a psychotic episode and has a breakdown, then it mandates that the his cabinet, the people he appoint, his closest advisors, are to go to Congress and say, listen, we no longer have any confidence in the president's capacity to govern. And then that will give the Congress the power to remove, to put the vice president or the, 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 uh, the uh, congressional leadership, the, the, the uh, Nancy Pelosi, put the, the second or third person in, in, in the succession of power in power. And it could be permanent, and they can completely oust the president or until the president comes through and gets a psychological or physical examination and is deemed fit to return to service. So there's a lot of talk about this because Trump is wilding out. But that's white folks' business. What does it mean to black people? Here's something that black people have to understand, being American citizens, seeking to be integrated, to be equal, and to have our rights, our humanity respected by those in authority. The U.S. government was made for white people. The U.S. Constitution was made for landed white males. And white people only adhere to the laws and the Constitution to the extent that it derives them the imbalance and unfair benefit. The moment that any people, black people particularly, but also Native Americans, and other people deemed non-white, the moment that they are able to utilize the laws that not only that white people wrote, but white people imposed on all other people around the globe, the moment that we, by adhering to their laws, following their rules, walking the path that they paved before us, the moment we start to achieve, they will violate those laws. They will change those laws. They will ignore those laws. For years, white people have been running around talking about the Constitution and slapping black people in the head with the Constitution. That's not constitutional. The Constitution doesn't recognize any race, creed, or blah, blah, blah. They would smack us in the face every time we would ask to say, hey, we need to be made whole. We need to fill these deficits. They would come to us and say things like states' rights. Black people would say, listen, we live in this, these, these southern states, these northern states, these midwestern states, 
and the county sheriff is a Klan's member. The mayor is a damn Klansman. The school superintendent is a Klansman. They're not letting us vote. We grow these crops. We, we, we take the crops to market. They don't give us market value. They burn our crops. They don't, we, we sign contracts. The white man violates the contracts. We take the white man to court. And the judge, who's a Klansman, doesn't give us our, our, day, our hearing in court. And then when we try to go home from court, our homes are burned down. We can't get any justice in the county. We can't get any justice in the township. We can't get any justice in the state. We take it to the state level. Our state legislator is a Klansman. So we would go to the federal government and white people were like, whoa, ho, ho, there, hold your horses, Padre. This is states' rights issues. If you can't get redressed from the state, therefore your, your case is null and void. States' rights. The Constitution grants the states the right to self-government. That's, and they would smack us right in the head with all these laws. And so black people were like, damn, okay, fine. Let me take your rule book. I'll take your rules, the racist rules, the white supremacists, the rapists, the pedophile, the enslaver, the colonizers. I will take the rules that you wrote. I will follow the protocols that you establish. And according to your rules, so I'm going to, what does it take to, to run for a public office? I need so many signatures. I need to live in a certain district. I need to be of certain age and a certain standing in my community. I'm going to run for office and, and, and get that cleanse. I'm going to run for sheriff. I'm going to run for commission. I'm going to run for mayor. Because I, I can't get any special consideration. And what did they do? They start, well, yeah, that's the law, but I tell you what. Law can kiss my ass, and they kill us. They lynch us. So even when we, it, most deaf said it best. When we start keeping pace, they change up the tempo. And I'm saying, black people, this isn't unique to us. Just ask any Native American. Look at all that good paper, Native. You think black folks got some good paper. You think black folks got some good laws, some good reforms, affirmative. You think black folks got some good deals, doggone good deals from white folks. You should look at the doggone good deals white folks gave to Native Americans. According to the research of Ward Churchill, if all of the, the, the treaties, the edicts, if all of the concessions made between given to the Native Americans from the white federal government, because the the, white, the Indians didn't have to go through the, they were a sovereign nation for all that's worth. So they didn't have to go through the county, the township, the city, the state. They didn't have to go through all these levels to get, they went straight to the feds. And historically in the United States, the federal government has been more liberal than state governments. If you think Donald Trump and the federal government under the Republicans or Buckwild, you should go to the state legislature of Kansas, the state legislature of Alabama, the state legislature. You think Trump is bad. You should see some of these crazy ass rednecks, some of these illiterate, stupid rednecks that are in positions of authorities, these boss hogs. You ever watch the Dukes of Hazard? All over the, the especially the Midwest and the South, you got all, and all Southern pride. And I know we're not supposed to make fun. We're supposed to be politically correct. We can't make fun. But Southern, yes, it, that stereotype of book, read the book by its cover. The cover ain't lying to you. Some really stupid people in power. I talked to some of these politicians, some of these uh, state legislatures in the dirty, dirty, in the Southern, Southern, the dirty, dirty South. Hell, some of our own people. I remember I spent a whole summer in Tennessee, and I swore I'd never go back down past the Mason Dixon line ever in my life. Southern. Ooh. But anyway, I digress. All I'm saying is, let me not get too far off the point. The Native Americans were able to go directly to the federal government. They didn't have to go through all the hoops we went through. And War Churchill stated that if everything was everything, if white people obeyed their own damn laws, because you know how white people love the Constitution, my rights. 
how they love their rats. He said if the U.S. had adhered Native Americans, Indians, each Native American to a person would be the richest people in the United States. And I know y'all have these illusions about the Indian casinos and white folks love to talk about how rich the Indians are from the casinos, but that's not the case. There's only one demographic in the United States that has a higher per capita incarceration rate than black people. That's Native Americans. Addiction rates, there's only one group, uh, demographic in the United States per capita that has a lower life expectancy than black people. That's Native Americans. And it goes on down the line, all the social indicators, but a lot of times they aren't counted because they're considered non-Americans. They are sovereign Cherokee. Now, they're still racist now. They're still anti-black. Didn't I tell you anti-blackism is a universal ideology? So I know a lot of people, oh, Indians don't like us. I, I'm not talking about who. This ain't about the emotion, how you feel, how they feel. This ain't what I'm talking about. ain't about how nobody's out your feelings. Get out your feelings. Everybody get out your feelings. As soon as the Bro Diallo broadcast is over, we can all get back in our feelings. But just know, if you don't believe the black example, you can look at the Native American example. The law of America, white people are lying when they say they love America. They love America to the extent that it can preserve their pathology. Y'all call it privilege, but it's pathology. White privilege, no, white pathology. To the extent that it can preserve their undue advantage over everyone else. That's what, they are loyal to America. They are loyal to the Constitution. They love the Founding Fathers to the extent that it will preserve their undue advantages. The moment it no longer serves their undue advantages, they will defecate on the Constitution. They will abandon the Founding Fathers. They will quit all this stuff about, you look at the government right now. Trump is in utter violation of, of, of at least two dozen constitutional congressional and executive norms and laws. Trump has committed on record from his own mouth at least five impeachable offenses from perjury to obstruction of justice to violating his oath of office to the to the uh, emoluments clause running his business while he's in a position of authority taking personal profit and using his public office for personal gain. Trump is a, a lawbreaker. And all these, his, the people who voted him into office are the main people who, like, watch him, uh, like Obama said, they wrap themselves in the Constitution, they clutch their Bibles and their guns. These people stand here and chant, USA. They are constitutionalists. These are the kind of people that drive around with pocket constitutions, and when the police pull them over, they know their rights. I know my rights. I love America. They don't give a damn about America. They care about their undue advantages. And if they have to violate the Constitution, if they have to violate the law, if they have to violate Christianity and anything else to reserve their undue privilege, they will do it. While they turn around and look at you in the face and say, you can't move because the Constitution doesn't allow you to. The law won't allow you to. This is not law. This is not fair. The same people that impose Christianity on you go right back to, they put you in a slave dungeon and tell you Jesus said, obey thy master. And then they go into the, the, the plantation uh, house and violate every single code of the, of the Bible. Why they got us obeying the Bible. Same thing with the Constitution. Same thing with the Muslims. The same people, the very people that taught us Islam violate every single tenet of Islam right in our faces. And then we run around to other black people trying, well, that's not real Christianity. That's not real Islam. Those not real Americans. They don't represent America. The hell they don't. All of those bodies, all of those uh, uh, holy books, all of those written laws, are for one purpose. And the moment they stop serving that one purpose of, of preserving the undue advantages, they will violate the laws. And at the same time, they put a gun to your head and enforce the laws, will kill you, will incarcerate you, will socially ostracize you, put a felony on you, make it so you can't live, work, or eat for breaking their laws. At the same time, they will violate their laws with impunity to preserve their status. And when they do get caught, like Paul Manafort was up for really a life sentence, anything 25 years to life sentence and only got four years in jail and gonna be out in under two, that's if Trump don't pardon him first. 
and Van Dyke, the boy, the man who murdered Laquan McDonald and then perjured himself. His co-conspirators got no time. He got less time. And then when the when the attorney uh, general said, we got to give this man more time. He's got shoplifting. He's got petty crime time for a major murder and a major conspiracy to cover up a murder, obstruction of justice, like Trump. And the judge said, no, time is sufficient. He got more time for murdering somebody and covering up the murder than my son would get if he went on a joyride in a stolen car and doesn't harm, hurt, or injure anybody. Just for part, we get, he got property violation time for murder. But yeah, we all gotta be polite. Black people don't wanna seem as seeking an unfair advantage. We don't wanna be seen as uh, uh, putting undue blame on, on white people. And we have to go to the white race and, and hand pick out each little individual racist and try to find where the individual race racist in the white haystack when we understand who cares about what any individual white person feels. It's institutional racism. It's historical racism. And regardless of how any individual white person feels about racism is as relevant as how any individual black person feels about racism. This is a speeding train as Howard Zinn would call it. It's a speeding train. And some people on the train are happy that the train is going as fast as it is in one direction. And other people on the train feel wish the train would slow down. Other people on the train wish the train would stop. Other people on the train wish the train would stop and go in the opposite direction. But regardless of how you feel on this damn train, the train is doing what it do. And your feelings about the train do not impact the train. So unless you're gonna jump off the damn train or you're gonna go up to the engineer's deck and and bash the engineer in the head and take over the train, unless you know, so got some kind of way where you can can uh, 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 obstruct the gears of the train, you can cut the fuel lines of the train, unless you're doing something concrete to stop that damn train, sitting on the train telling, you know, people, well, I'm, I don't agree with the direction this train is going. That don't help the people that are, that are, are, are being, heading towards their doom. So saying, I don't agree with racism. On, a, on, a, on the racism train. What are you doing to derail the train? What are you doing to stop and reverse the train? Feeling bad about it? So this is not about your feelings. This is not about your white friend or your black friend, your white spouse or your black spouse. This is about institutional concrete realities, material realities. Your feelings, just like our feelings. I feel really, really, I am utterly enraged by the ongoing coup d'etat against Venezuela. I'm outraged. My sentiment does not impact this criminal act. I'm outraged about the, the ongoing subversion of Haiti. I'm outraged by the sanctions against Cuba. I'm outraged by AFRICOM. Yeah, I got a lot of outrage, but I got to figure out something to do. So, we know two things. The white race is a predatory species. And listen, any white people listening to me, uh, you're getting mad at me, you, you're mad at the wrong person. <clears throat> and believe you me, I'm the easiest person to convince of anything. I'm the easiest person to convince of anything. You go find any evidence that white people have lived in proximity to non-white people. And that's another thing. We're black people. We, we're also fighting a lot about who's black and who's not black, who's black enough, who's insufficiently black, mulatto or mixed race, mulattoes, or this and that. Dr. Francis Wilson said, white people only recognize two races. White people only recognize two races, and that's white and non-white. And those two races aren't even solid. Those are fluid. So you can be in the non-white box trying to get to the top of the non-white well, I'm black, but all in all, let me tell you something. <laughs> and let me tell you something. That's no different than Jews in the gas chamber arguing about who's Orthodox Jews, who's Ashkenazim Jews, who's Sephardic Jews, who's the real Jews, who's an authentic Jew, who's more Jewish or less Jewish, secular Jews are not as Jewish as Orthodox Jews, Eastern Jewry is not as Jewish as the westernized integrated Jewry. 
but we're in the goddamn gas chamber. And by the time we all figure it out and all the Jews line up in their proper Jew boxes, the gas comes on. And what was it all for? And you're saying we're not in a gas chamber. I agree. We are on planet Earth and the life sustaining capacity of the planet Earth is down. They went from building gas chamber to turning the whole planet into a death camp. The oceans are being raped and devoid of life. Every ecosystem, all mammal, mammalian species are going extinct. There isn't one ecosystem on the face of the earth, whether you go to the bottom of the ocean or to the top of the Arctic, to the most tropical, to the most frigid, to the tundra, to, to the Amazon. There isn't one ecosystem that isn't contaminated and in decline and the major species are going extinct. The world is under a major extinction event. I just told y'all the Midwest, the buried basket of America is underwater, under contaminated water, by the way. And we got this stuff they call them bomb cyclones in the Midwest. What the hell is a cyclone happening in the Midwest for? So they we're all in the damn gas chamber right now. I tell y'all, the Nazis lost the war. But the Nazi ideology won. Look at the fundamental values of the fundamental mission of Liebenstrom, of the Ubermensch. Look at the fundamental ideology of the Nazi party. Well, we know all the crazy stuff they did. We know all the Nazi symbols. We know all the people. We know the body count. 20 million Slavs. And they killed, they, they made the gays wear the triangle. The Jews, six million Jews, we know the number, but we very seldom do people study the fundamental ideology of the Nazis. And if you the reason people don't study, the reason there's been literally hundreds of books written about Hitler and the Nazis, every year there's some grand Oscar-winning party, the pianist, Schindler's List, some Oscar-winning uh, uh, movie about the Holocaust and the triumph. Of, of, of the perseverance of the human spirit, that movie Defiance, which I like, Guerrilla Warfare, we're going to be talking about Guerrilla Warfare on Friday's show, how people persevered against the Nazis. But you never hear the Western media say, listen, these are the basic ideas that motivate. This is the Nazi ideology. And it was not, oh, Jews are bad, white people are superior. Jews had a governing ideology. They had a base worldview and social theories and economic protocols. And if you look at that, you will find that the United States, Great Britain, Australia, Canada, and even Brazil under Bolsonaro, uh, the Philippines, even African Mobutu Sese Seiko, uh, Colombia, the Nazi ideology won. It's like when they killed the, the Nazi dragon, there were spores released, and everybody inhaled those spores. The world is governed by a Nazi-esque ideology. And the reason why the Nazis in power get mad at the low-level so-called neo-Nazis, because they're exposing the game. And white people as wicked as they are, are very strategic. And they understood if there is a mass awakening among the non-whites, they can't hold it, even with their nuclear bombs. They figured it out in Vietnam. And then they relearned that lesson in Iraq, superior weaponry alone cannot win a war. If the people are awakened and, 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 and emotionally, psychologically, culturally committed to a cause, all the bombs in the world will not stop those people. They learned that in Vietnam. They forgot it for a little bit, and then they relearned it in Iraq, when that Iraqi insurgency, and we were told for 10 years, those Iraqis are crazy Muslims. We also learned it with, in, in Afghanistan, those crazy uh, people, they're just crazy, they're just killed, they're just bloodthirsty. And that those same people they told us were crazy, bloodthirsty savages, now they're sitting across the negotiation table. Why, it was like, oh, Jesus Christ, what do you want? And now you got to negotiate. You came with every bomb. You came with the mother of all bombs. Murder, death, kill. Mass slaughter. Torture. Mutilation. And now they're like, yo, the project for a new American century, they have to sit down and rewrite the agenda. 
Afghanistan was the springboard to Iraq. Iraq was the springboard to 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 um, to uh, Iran. They were supposed to take Iran, expand uh, expand NATO up to the Baltic states, to the former uh, uh, Soviet bloc states. They were going to encircle economically and militarily encircle Russia and China. It all broke down, and it didn't break down because of the mighty army of China or them. It took a bunch of uh, uh, like I always say, malnourished guerrillas with old rusty Kalashnikovs. We're able to stop the great, the trillion dollar war machine of America. So they understand this. And they understood propaganda is a better tool. Make your people believe, make the blacks believe they can be made white. Give them the illusion. Prop up some Negroes that will go around telling black folks, we can get our freedom. All we need is for the white man to turn on his printing presses for an extra day over the, every alternate weekends for two weeks. Print out a, it's a little bit of more a, a fiat currency and give it to the leaders that will misappropriate it, and i.e. give it to the rest of the people. They find that giving, selling us illusions is more effective than blowing our brains out. Because they are still, not only are white people a global minority, the white elites are a minority within a minority. So the only way for the 1% to rule over the 99% is for the 1% to totally mind control and mind rape the 99%. And then have us thinking that we have all these internal differences that don't freaking matter ultimately. We're in the gas chamber talking about light skin privilege. We're in the gas chamber talking about black men or the white men of black people. While the black man's in the gas chamber with you. He's not standing outside holding the lever next to the white. What's this game about? It is late in the day, people. It is late in the day. We are at zero hour. The clock is about to strike midnight. The Midwest. I didn't even get to talk about what I really wanted to talk about today. The breadbasket of America is underwater. I don't know if you do agriculture or farming. And the little water is a great thing. Enough water is the best thing. But too much water is as much a catastrophe as too little water. And you see these white psychopaths are running around trying to build gardens, build farms inside of factories, build farms underground. So we're going to be eating farm food that never touched the soil and that has never been subjected to uh, 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 sunlight. We're going to eat food that was washed in a chemical bath and illuminated by artificial lights. How would that affect humanity? I don't know because we evolved over the last six million years eating food that was exposed to direct sunlight and grown in the soil. But they were like, it's, the, the climate is too unpredictable to grow in the ground. I've been farming in Chicago, been doing urban agriculture in Chicago for the last five years, and every single year has been a different climate and different conditions than the year before. And every year I have to make adjustments on the fly, make it up as I go. But when I just, uh, 10 years ago, when I was gardening and, 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 and farming in Missouri and in Kansas, it was pretty predictable. I could go out there, do the same thing, plant the same stuff in the same row, and I'm done. Do a little pruning, do a little weeding, do a little watering, and wait for the food to come. But y'all think y'all walk into Wally World, Walla 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 Walmart, y'all wa or some of I'm sorry, Walmart. I apologize. You walk into Whole Foods, and you see row and row and row and row and row of food, so it's all gravy. And you know, because we're American, we have American lives. Then when there is a shortage, they're gonna prioritize America. So that we'll send uh, super tankers, we'll send aircraft carriers to Africa, to Mexico. We'll send an armada to Mexico and take their crops. Even and if it gets real hardcore, we'll go to Canada and take Canadian crops. This is America. God, God is an American. We prioritize ourselves. But even when that dries up, when there's no more food to steal from the third world. And there's no more even food to hustle from, from America's allies. Then they're going to prioritize the white people. 
And then when that gets too tight, they're going to prioritize the white men. And then when that gets to food gets even tighter, they're going to prioritize the white men with the most money. And instead of blowing up this system, instead of rebelling against this system, you're just trying to climb the ladder. Well, if I could become a white man, if I could be made white, even though I'm a black man or a black woman, if I can get the money a white man got, the status the white man got, the, 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 the allies and show that I'm a loyal asset to the white man, then I could still eat at his table on a dying planet, a scramble. And these sick white people have this saying, who, he who dies with the most toys win. I wanted to talk about self-reparations, but I think I'm going to be talking about, tomorrow I'm going to talk about guerrilla warfare. And I'm sorry, I'm not even motivated. And I'll, I'll do this. I, I will. Can I tell you something? They don't have the power to repair us. They don't have the capacity. They're broken. The capitalists, the imperialists, the colonizers, the oppressors don't have a capacity to fix a damn thing. They can't even fix themselves. They can't even get their children to stop, you know, snorting fentanyl. They're in crisis. And yes, they have a capacity. They print the fiat money. It means nothing. When you got congressmen right now that are posting memes talking about, we got a trillion bullets, so let's fight another civil war. And said that the South has a trillion, the stupid people in the South have a trillion bullets, while the, while the educated people in the North are trying to figure out what gender should use what bathroom. And black people, we're still trying to integrate into this nonsense, into this madness. We want to reject Africans. We want to reject, reject Jamaicans. We want to reject Panamanians. And we want to ride our African option. I mean, ride the American option. As if any of these borders matter. This is not even, the United States of America is an idea pulled out of the rectum of rapists, pedophiles, slavers. The borders were drawn. You're going to live and, and allow your self-definition to be tied to the ideas, the vision, the ambition of pedophile, rapists, and slavers. To hell with America. Or as God, goddamn America. Knowing damn well that as soon as the stuff hit the fan, all these true Americans, the people who really get paid in America, they will go off to Dubai. They're already doing it. The billionaires, they're building compounds in the mountains of Chile. They're off to Dubai, living at the top of those skyscrapers. While they hear funding campaigns of patriotism, the same people that fund the patriotism campaigns that go to China to manufacture the flags that they pass out at wrestling, world wrestling, and tractor pools. Those are the same people that don't keep their money. They got their money in the Caymans. They got their, 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 their hard currency gold in Switzerland. They don't give a damn about America. And we over here fighting about who's right, who's all right, we're Americans. Nigerians can't come here and replace us. We just had white races in, 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 in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, talking about Jews will not replace us. And now we got black people talking about Nigerians will not replace us. Thinking a Nigerian getting some movie roles is us being replaced. Have y'all lost y'all goddamn minds? Me not know. Anyway, we have to, as African people, if nothing else, we need a sober assessment of, the, of, of reality. Because even if you're the most dedicated black person and you're a member of the most dedicated, pure, non-corrupt black organization, if y'all are working off of misconceptions, if y'all are working off of falsehoods, if y'all are working off of misinterpretations, if you are working out of uh, corrupt or slanted data, it doesn't matter how hard you work or how righteous you are in your heart. 
we need some fundamental reality check. And But in the world of social media, people can dictate their own reality. I'm a vegan atheist. I can create a social media environment where I do nothing but hear from and see everything I see can validate my belief about the world. They allow us to construct our own world. We are able to make our own matrix. Uh, I'm blocking this person. I'm going to join this group. I'm going to only go here and there and where we can create these warped sense of, of you know, I mean, if I was only to dwell in my own little bubble, most of my closest friends and associates, not all of them, but most of them are vegan. But I know damn well that don't reflect the, the, the majority. But then when I go home to kick it with my peoples, when I go back to flooded Missouri, I realize, wait, I, I was living in a bubble. Most people do not have the thoughts that I have. They do not have the value system that I have, and they do not live the lifestyle I live. But anyway, this is a war. It is a war that we cannot opt out of. All the burning of sage. Oh, and today's the first day of spring. Maybe that's what, maybe what, mercury and retro retrograde. I don't know. I apologize. I look at my notes. I didn't get to what I wanted to cover on my notes. But I just went where the spirit took me. On this first day of spring, the spring equinox, we need revolution. And uh, I really appreciate black people that do good things, trying to economic empowerment, working on housing, incarceration, I've worked on those same issues. I've marched in, in everything. I've marched in everything from animal rights protests to teachers union strikes, and I'm not even a damn teacher. And I went out and marched with the teacher. Well, my wife's a teacher, so I'm not that benevolent. My wife was a CPSD, so I've marched. I've sucked on a little tear gas. Fortunately, I'm, I've been arrested a few times in, in various protests, but I've never been convicted. They just do the mass arrest, and after the rabble is gone, they drop the charges. I understand that work, I value that work, I've been a part of that work, but we need revolution. All of your good works need to be tied, need to be enacted with the intent. I'm working on rape victims, I'm working on education, I'm working on housing with the intent of overthrowing capitalism and destroying the systems and institutions of global white domination. The people who rule the world are unworthy and unfit to rule the world, and my ultimate goal in doing this good thing is to revolutionize every other person I come into contact with. Revolutionize your church. Revolutionize your community. Revolutionize your bedroom. Tell you. You know, before y'all take out the whips and the chains and the other instruments, I'm not judging. Before y'all get into all that, sit and talk about how you can work together in your relationship to overthrow the systems and institutions of global white domination. Then get with the fuzzy handcuffs and get with that. But make sure, even revolutionize your relationships. Because if we don't overthrow this system, it will destroy not only us, it will destroy the life-saving capacity, the life-sustaining capacity of the planet Earth. Even if you are broiled in anti-blackness, even if you're self-hating, whatever on this planet you do love, if you love the, 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 the yellow belly sap sucker, the redhead woodpecker, if you love dolphins, whatever you do love, capitalism and white domination is a threat to that thing. Any living thing that you think is of value, even if you are Kanye West or Clarence Thomas and you love nothing but white people. White people are threatened by white domination. White people are dying due to capitalism and white domination. They might be the last to go. The last living specimen on this planet might be a wealthy white man in a bunker somewhere. But that, even they are eventually going to get bit. So even if you are a self-hating Uncle Tom Negro, you should want to overthrow capitalism and global white domination. Capitalism, the mentality that everything has a price, every living thing is a commodity. And if you don't commodify, you can't amass Fiat. If you can't amass fiat, what's the point of existence? That's the sick, the objectivist, Ian Randian 
philosophy that's governing the world, the Nazi philosophy. And everybody loves Britain. You go watch those Marvel movies and you watch them fight alien threats that are threatening existence. You can be a Marvel hero. Because there is a, a, a system, there is an ideology, and there are individuals who are threatening the world just like Thanos. And instead of watch heroes save the world, you can literally live your life in a way to save the world. Get join the revolution. And the revolution is the most anti multifaceted experience you're into music the revolution is all about art you won't find a successful revolution that did not have a strong art component so music painting dancing revolution is there you can advance the cause sustain the cause justify the cause you want to grow food there is no element no area of human revo uh, uh, relations where revolution cannot be advanced and, and, and uh, sustained. We have the capacity, black people, we have the capacity to liberate ourselves. We, don't, we lack the will. We lack the vision. We lack the cohesion. And fine. All those things are there laying around waiting for us to put it together. All of the basic elements of everything we lack are laid out before us. We just got to act on them. And we got to be consistent. And you got to get out your damn feelings. I don't like this dude. I don't like them. They don't agree. We, revolution is just waiting for us to carry it out. It's nothing mysterious. It's nothing divine. It's nothing magical. It's not even spiritual. And I'm sorry, I know that upsets some people. It's human beings, flesh and blood, taking collective action. Anyway, this is Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. You can listen to the Bro Diallo Show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. You can listen at the Q4 website anywhere in the world. You can also download the TuneIn app or iTunes radio, or if you already have it downloaded, you can go and search Q4, Q-U-E, the number four. Also, if you are in the city of Chirac, State of Drill, Illinois, and I don't think today is March 30th, first day of spring, in the year of your Lord, 2019, city of Chirac, State of Drill, Illinois, United States of America, cuh, cuh, of captive, dying planet Earth. But if you are in the city of Chicago, you can uh, listen also on the old school radio frequency, AM, AM 1680. Anyway, um, I'll see y'all Friday. We're going to talk about guerrilla warfare. And uh, anyway, that's that. That's the Bro Diallo show for today. Oh, announcement. We're going to start our talking about farming. Um, Friday and Saturday, we're going to begin work and basically orient uh, people who want to come out and grow at the Hells Franciscan Farm, Urban Farm. So, you know, check me on Facebook uh, and I'll create a calendar. You can come up and so sign up to volunteer and you will get, you know, an abundance of organic free food grown by your hand. And we always have a surplus of food. But our, the, the amount of food we grow always outnumbers the amount of people we distribute it. And so we give a lot of food to, to the community as well. So if you want to, to grow farms. But I need people that are going to be down for the whole grow season. We basically grow between March and October and or November. So it, it is a, a, a significant commitment. It's not something you have to do every day. But if you do come out, be willing to at least commit one or two uh, during one or two days a week for a couple of hours to come out there and, and cultivate and sustain the, the area. So it is a long-term commitment. And, uh, but if you want to come out and grow food with us, you're welcome. And to grow some organic food for your home and for the community, um, organic, non-GMO uh, food. And so anyway, let me, let me get out of here. My time is up. I'll see y'all Friday.